Okay, I'm going to be reading out of Isaiah 53, 10 to 11. It says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So I want to talk to you today about the suffering of Christ, the passion of Christ. And I think the uh, atonement of Christ and His suffering, it's, it's the greatest thought that we could ever have in this life. It's the greatest contemplation we could ever have when we think of what, what Christ went through and what Christ endured. And the atonement is the greatest doctrine in, in all of history. The atonement is the greatest truth in all of the universe. And so, uh, I often meditate and think about what Christ has done for us and what He has endured. And um, I have uh, a specific aspect of His suffering that I want to address. You know, when you think of the Passion of Christ, you often think of you know, His back being torn open by the whips or his hands being pierced, his feet, his feet being pierced. Maybe you think about the crown of thorns that was put on his head. These are the types of images that we have of his suffering. But I think the greatest suffering that Christ endured was not physical. It was not something you can, you can see with your physical eye. That the greatest suffering that Christ had was of his soul. And here in this verse, it says that he's going to be bearing grief. He'll be put to grief. That his soul, not just his body, but his soul, would be made an offering for sin. And that God would see the travail of his soul and to be satisfied. Now we read in Luke twenty-two forty-four. 44. We can go there. He says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And so the suffering of Christ did not begin on the cross. It did not be begin when he was whipped. The suffering of Christ began right here in the garden. It says his soul was in agony. He was in agony. Now this agony ha was not physical. No one had laid any hands on him yet. This agony was of the soul, of the mind. And it was so intense that medical science says in such agony the capillaries in your sweat glands can burst. So you can sweat drops of blood. This type of suffering is not isolated to Christ. There's other documented instances of someone in such agony that they actually sweat drops of blood because of the agony of their heart which so affects their body. So when did the suffering of Christ begin? It was here in the garden. And this agony was of the soul. I think this can give us great insight into the events that occurred here in the garden. You know, you often hear you know, Jesus prayed, Father, you know, if possible, let this cup pass from me. And it's represented as if Jesus was trying to avoid the cross. Well, this would seem quite inconsistent with his mission, with his incarnation, with his life. He had often testified to his disciples, the Son of Man must suffer and to be rejected of men. 
Christ already knew that he must suffer. So it would seem inconsistent for Christ to be praying to avoid the cross. And then you have in the Calvinistic theory of the atonement that Christ was going to be you know, drinking the cup of God's wrath. And he was afraid of the wrath of God. So he prayed, if possible, let that cup pass from me. But we know from the Bible that Jesus did not drink the cup of God's wrath. Because in Revelation, the cup of God's wrath is still full. The cup of God's wrath is being poured out. Jesus said to his disciples, Are you able to drink the cup that I drink of? He said, Yes, you are able. And certainly the disciples did not drink the cup of God's wrath. So this idea that Christ is trembling and afraid of the wrath of God and he's praying, God, if possible, let me avoid your wrath, that's not a true view at all. It's not accurate at all. Now there's been cases throughout history when Christian martyrs have gone to the stake and have been killed and tortured and they've gone willingly. They've gone with joy. They've sung hymns while they're being put to death. Well, Certainly God in the flesh uh, is not less brave than they are. Certainly God in the flesh is no coward. He knew what his mission was from the beginning. So when Christ prayed, let this cup pass from me, well, what is he praying about? Well, if we go to Matthew 26, verse 38 to 39, Then he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further, and he fell down on his face, and he prayed, saying, O Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, some commentators will comment on this verse where it says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. And, and this means that the, the agony of his heart, the agony of his mind, could have literally brought about his death right there in the garden. And that's quite the thought to think that Christ was in such agony in the garden, he almost died there. There's been instances, documented instances, of someone being in such agony and then in such grief that they've died on the spot. There was one story I was reading in a medical book of a, of a woman who was saying goodbye to her son as he, was, as he was going off to war. I believe he was in the Navy and he was sailing off on the ships. And as she's waving goodbye and she's in such agony at his, at his departure that she died then and there. from the agony of her heart. It took her life. So there is this intense agony of the soul, which is hard for us to understand, that can literally take someone's life on the spot. And here Jesus says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. So Jesus could have died right then and there in the garden by that sorrow. And it was in the context of this sorrow that he prayed, let this cup pass from me. He wasn't praying for, a, for that cup or some cup that was going to come upon him in the future or in the far or near future, but for the cup that he was currently enduring. Let this cup in the present tense, what he's currently having, let it be taken from me, meaning it's already upon him. You can't take something away from someone unless they're already in possession of it. So Jesus is saying, take this cup away from me, something he's already possessing. Now was Jesus uh, trying to avoid the cross? Certainly not. But if it was possible that Christ was in such exceedingly great agony that he could have died there in the garden, what effects would have that have had on his mission? 
You know, Jesus said, the Son of Man must be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. You see, for the atonement to have its proper influence, it needed to be public. If Christ really did die there in the, in the secret, you know, the privacy of the garden, it would not have had the necessary effect upon the public. And so it w some uh, have speculated that the cup, he was praying uh, for relief from, was this sorrow unto death that he had right then in the garden. So it was not Christ praying to avoid the cross, but Christ praying to get to the cross. Now, um, if we look at Hebrews 5.7, It says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. So this says that the prayer of Christ was heard. And this, this Greek word, if you look it up, it doesn't mean that God just audibly heard it but that God paid attention to it and answered it. We, uh, we use this language in our own uh, you know, vocabulary. When uh, you know, someone has a request and, and we say, yes, I, you know, I'm going to listen to that request. It doesn't mean you're just going to hear what they say, but that you're going to grant it to them. So this says that Christ, when he was praying in the garden, his prayer was actually heard. God actually listened to it. God actually delivered him from death, then and there in the garden. Now there were times uh, when they tried to kill Christ before. They tried to stone him. They tried to throw him off a cliff. And God, God intervened and God delivered him. Well, if the suffering of Christ, according to Isaiah 53, was primarily to consist in the agony of his soul, well then certainly stoning or being thrown off a cliff would have prevented that. Because it wouldn't have allowed for this proper duration, the, the proper time needed for Christ to endure this agony of his soul. Stoning is re relatively quick. Being thrown off a cliff is relatively quick. So God intervened. Because the nature of his suffering was going to be agony of heart and agony of soul. And the same would have applied if Christ was going to die there in the garden. God needed to intervene so that it would have had this proper uh, effect on the public. And when he prayed, it was heard. Now, now this, is, this is just one... I mean the. One possible uh, interpretation, what I'm giving you now. This is one uh, possible uh, view. But it would give answer as to what it means that he was, he was heard in the garden. That God actually brought this temporary deliverance uh, from him, which he later took on again when he was on the cross. You see, Christ was in such great agony in the garden. But when he was before Pilate, he was not. When the soldiers came to arrest him, he was not. In fact, he said, who are you searching for? I am him. He was not shrinking back. He, he was not sorrowful. It would seem that the deliverance he was seeking, he received. Now, I can imagine Christ sweating blood and being down on his on his knees and his hands on his head and he's, he sees the blood dripping onto his hands. The blood is dripping from his fingers. And he says, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. It's agony that he's in currently. So God answered that prayer and gave him this temporary relief, this temporary deliverance that he needed. So when the soldiers came and when he stood before Pilate, 
he was able to face them uh, without this uh, agony and without this sorrow, which he again took, uh, took up upon uh, the cross. Now, I've asked people on campus, what, what, what did Jesus die from? There's been various medical studies. What, what actually killed Christ? You know, physically speaking, medically speaking. Uh, when I was at the Univer uh, University of Missouri, I asked the crowd, what do you think killed Christ? And a woman said, asphyxiation, suffocation. Because that's the uh, normal mode of death through crucifixion. Crucifixion normally will take, uh, you know, two to three days, even sometimes up to seven days to kill a man. And eventually the weight of his own body will crush out his lungs so that he, he fails to, to, to take a breath and he dies of suffocation, asphyxiation. Well, Jesus did not hang on the cross for two to three days or up to seven days. In fact, we have evidence all throughout the recordings of his death. For example, John 19.33, if we go there, it says, but when they came to Jesus and saw he was dead already, and they broke not his legs. You see, the Passover was coming, and to prepare for the Passover there on the Sabbath day, the men who were on the cross would have their legs broken so that they would die quicker. Because a man with a broken leg, or broken legs, won't be able to stretch out to relieve the pressure on his lungs to take a breath. So if you break his legs, his lungs will be crushed out quicker and he'll die of suffocation. Well, here it says they broke not his legs because Jesus had died already. And Pilate seemed to be surprised at this, that he was already dead. Now, Pilate is an expert on crucifixion. The Romans would crucify thousands of people every day, or not every day, but thousands of people all the time. Pilate was an expert on crucifixion, yet he was surprised that Jesus was dead already. Now we also know right before his death in Luke 23, verse 46, And when he had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So here, Christ was able to cry out with a loud voice right before he died. A man dying of suffocation could not do this. A man who was suffocating to death could not do this. He would have no breath. But moments before his death, he cried out with a loud voice. Which shows it was not the cross that killed Christ. It was not the normal mode of suffering, of suffocation or asphyxiation that took his life. But what is it then that actually killed Christ? We have a very unique... Uh, Description in the Gospel of John that's not found in any other Gospel. Verse, uh, or chapter 19, verse 33, or verse 34. Because when they saw that he was dead already, it says, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood, and water. Now some people think this blood and water and throughout you know Catholic church history that this is symbolic, that this is a miracle. In fact the Catholics will use this as some type of reference to the Eucharist. Well this is no miracle. 
This is medical. This is post-mortem uh, evidence of how Christ died. This is the closest to an autopsy we're ever going to get. Now something I've studied about the human anatomy is that the heart, of course we know the heart to be a muscle, and around the heart is a sac called the pericar uh, pericardium sac. And that, that contains fluid, which keeps the heart moist. It keeps it from getting dry. And if someone were to, if someone were to take a, a spear and to pierce my heart and to pierce that sac around the heart, well, they're not going to see blood and water. Because there is, while there is some uh, liquid or serum in that sac, and there is some blood, of course, in my heart, the two would mingle together on their way out. So you're not going to see what looks like blood and water. They would be mingled together. And the sac naturally uh, does not have a, a substantial amount of liquid. Neither does the heart. And so you're not going to see a, 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 a very substantial amount, if any at all, coming out of my side if my heart were to be pierced. But here, John witnessed a substantial, a noticeable amount of blood and water. And they were separate. They didn't mingle together. Well, when, when a person dies of mental agony, mental anguish, it can literally rupture their heart. It's called cardiac rupture. Where the violent palpitations of the heart literally rip and tear at the tissues of the heart. And once the heart has a rupture, blood will start gushing out of that rupture and fill the pericardium sac. Or pericardium sac. And it's been recorded that even up to a pint of blood can be held in that sac, which is pretty substantial. And over the period of two to three hours, there's the coagulation process where the serum separates from the blood. And so if Jesus on the cross reassumed that agony he had in the garden, the sorrow unto death, that the violent palpitations of his heart literally tore his muscle in his heart and ruptured it, and blood gushed out of that wound and filled up that sack, and then over two to three hours the coagulation process uh, occurred. So when the soldiers came with that spear and they pierced him, and they pierced that sack and pierced his heart. It could be up to a pint of blood that had now separated from the serum. Could have come pouring out. And you would notice blood and water. And so uh, it's been uh, a general consensus of the medical world that what Jesus Christ died of was not suffocation or asphyxiation you can literally say Jesus died of a broken heart. Jesus died of a ruptured cardiac, a broken heart. Now if we go to Psalm 69, verse 20 to 21. It says, Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, and there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. And they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. So here's a psalm referencing the atonement of Christ. Now, is this a direct prophecy, or is it through similarity? Well, it, it seems like, uh, you know, it could be either. But, so, this can be applied to Christ. He says, reproach has broken my heart. You know, the sin of the world has always affected God. The rejection of the world has always broken His heart. God said in Genesis 6, 5-6, 
that when he saw the wickedness of man, that it was great on the earth, it grieved him in his heart. God said in Ezekiel, I believe chapter 18, says, I am broken with their whorish hearts. So even God, in His divinity, in His perfection, in His, in His infinite state, had a broken heart over the sin of the world. Well, how much more then would God in the flesh, God as a man, be affected by that as well? So it was not the whipping, it was not the crown, it was not the cross, it was not the nails that killed Christ. But the rejection and sin of the world literally broke his heart. And that God in flesh, God in his humanity, could not bear that agony. God in his, in his infinite state can have a broken heart and yet live forever. He can have infinite grief and live forever. So God cannot die, but God in the flesh it became more than he could bear in his physical strength. And he says, reproach has broken my heart. Now I find this quite interesting. You know, an evidence of uh, the, the accuracy of the Gospels that certainly John, when he recorded the blood and water, he's no medical... Uh, you know, expert on the heart. He, you know, a lot of this knowledge that we have now is, has been newly understood in the medical world. And John simply recorded what he saw, that Jesus had blood and water pour out of his side. And uh, this just gives, in my mind, uh, more and more evidence you know, obviously what we all already know, that Christ really was a man, that he really died on the cross. I think this can be great evidence for the world to believe. That now we, we have, you know, medical understanding of how he died. And it was, it was even predicted here in Psalms that Jesus would have died of a broken heart. Now how is this supposed to affect us? Well, when you think about the blood of Christ, where our, our sins are atoned for by the blood of Christ, if you, if you think that the, the blood that literally gushed out of His broken heart is what atones for our sin, that, that His heart literally ruptured and, and broke under such great grief and agony, and, and the blood that flowed out of that broken heart is what atones for our wickedness. Well, that should have a very deep and profound effect upon our own heart, upon our own mind. Then you think of how much our sin has affected God. That our sin literally took His life upon the cross. That our love of wickedness, our, our hatred for God, our rejection of God, literally broke His heart as He agonized on the cross. And we see what an evil thing sin really is. What great suffering and grief sin really causes. Not only to ourselves, and not only to our fellow man, but the grief and agony that sin has caused to God. And that should affect us, and so much so when you look at the cross and you see what God was willing to endure for us, what God went through for us, we should fall in love with God. We should fall deeper in love with God the more that we meditate on it, and the more that we think upon it. So much so that we love Him and consequently obey Him. You see the good character of God, the mercy of God, the patience of God. God has never wronged anyone. God has never sinned against anyone. God has been nothing but good towards us. And God was even willing to, to forego His... His, uh, you know, justice towards us and extend mercy. That we should love Him and obey Him as a consequence. So the effect upon us when we look at, upon the cross, it should bring us to a place where it subdues our own heart. 
And if the atonement does not subdue the heart of a selfish, wicked person, then nothing ever could. There's no greater thought that could enter your mind in regards to the character and love of God than what was demonstrated at the cross. So there's no greater influence to subdue our, our selfish hearts than the atonement of Jesus Christ. And so as street preachers, and as uh, people that bring the gospel out to the lost, the atonement is our greatest weapon. The atonement is the greatest influence that we can exert upon their mind and exert upon their will. The greatest thought we can bring their mind to contemplate what God had done for them, what Jesus had done for them. That's our greatest weapon in bringing them to repentance. So the Apostle John said, we love him because he first loved us. Seeing his love will beget love in us towards him. And the atonement has an effect upon the entire universe. If you go to Revelation, Revelation 5, Eleven to thirteen. This shows the influence and effect that the atonement has upon the entire universe. It says, and I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature that is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. So this is quite the influence that the atonement of Christ has upon all of his universe. It says 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands and every creature in heaven and every creature in earth and every creature that's under the earth. All of them. saying, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And so, God has been able to secure, through the atonement of Jesus Christ, a far greater influence than He would have secured through our damnation. If God were to damn us as we deserve to be, certainly that would, sh that would show His severity and cause the universe to fear Him and to fear violating His law. But to see that Christ was willing to suffer and die for our sins, well, that causes the universe to love God. And to see how, how honorable, how awesome, how great must the law of God be that even the Son of Man, even the Son of God, was willing to suffer for it. And if God spared not His own Son, and so they see God's great regard for holiness, God's great regard for His law, and God's great regard for His people. And you see how worthy God is to be worth worshipped. And so, so I wanted to bring to your minds the nature of His suffering, the agony of His heart and soul, which was caused by our sin. I literally took his life upon the cross and realized that it's, it's that suffering, that suffering in death on the cross, which is a substitute for our damnation and which should bring us to complete and total and absolute obedience in all things and which shows that He is worthy to be worshipped and honored 
and served and obeyed in everything that we do. So let's just pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. And your word is truth. Father, I thank you for your sacrifice on uh, behalf of our sin. I thank you for your suffering and agony of heart and mind, which is far greater than the suffering of your body. Oh, Father, I just pray that we will live lives worthy of you, and we will love you and obey you and serve you in all that we think, say, and do. Father, I just pray that your sacrifice will never be forgotten in our hearts and minds, that we'll meditate upon it daily, think about it often, that it'll inspire us to love as you loved, to sacrifice as you sacrificed, to give as you gave, to promote your honor, your glory, and to save souls. So I just pray that you can use us in this world, in the short lifespan that we have here on this earth, in this world, to preach your gospel, to preach the good news, to bring sinners to repentance. And that we will, for the rest of our lives, live in such a way that brings joy to your heart, that will bless your heart, bring happiness to your mind, that we won't provoke you to anger, and that we will not grieve you in your heart. In the things that we do, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.